It was, uh, I've got to think, I went to work with Howard Godshock back from Vietnam in 1971. 1972, or later in 71, I followed up an ad in the Los Angeles Times. I lived out at the beach, and I followed up an ad for an allergist, uh, or an ear, nose, and throat doctor, the one to start doing allergy work, <clears throat> and I went to visit him. He was an old name around, you know, the little city I lived in. It was called Westchester, right near the airport, and I went to Westchester High School and so forth, and... So I knew this name, Howard Godshock, and I went to visit him, and uh, he just hired me like that. And the reason, folks, it isn't you know that I was very desirable or was a great employee, uh, it's because I had a background in emergency medicine. Now, when you work in allergy, uh, whether it be respiratory allergy, airborne allergy, food allergy, you know, drug allergy, when you work in that, you always have to consider what we call type one allergic response, anaphylaxis, right? You put peanut in your mouth, and you fall on the floor bouncing. Uh, you would want someone in that situation to be armed in emergency medicine. Know what epinephrine is, you know, know what a, a, a endotracheal tube is, and how to intubate, and so forth. Um, and so he hired me just like that. And he gave me, John, the full $550 a month that I was demanding. $550 a month. And I didn't demand it. He actually offered me that. I was uh, paying $100. Gary and Don and I had a, an apartment, a three-bedroom apartment down in Playa del Rey that was $300 a month. You off? You have a good one. Um, and we were each paying $100 a month. We had our bedroom and our own bath and so forth in this beautiful little beach condo. And so I needed $500 a month. Um, and that's exactly $550 is what Howard offered me. Now... <clears throat> After I had been there, he sent me over L.A. training with various allergists, and I didn't get along very well with allergists. I probably still don't. I, I don't understand why a pediatrician would leave pediatrics and, you know, go into work with allergies. I guess it's a specialty. You can make X working in pediatrics, and you can make X plus Y working in allergy because you're a specialist. Maybe that's the reason. I, I don't have any idea. But <clears throat> I went to work for Howard, and within a year or two, he sent me to the Washington University School of Medicine. Here's what followed. It, it follow, his, his sending me followed a patient coming in. I forget the guy's name, but he was an aerospace engineer, young guy, really nice guy that I hadn't seen in a couple of months. And the, uh, the story in allergy is, look, come in and I'm going to do a series of tests on your back or intracutaneous little bubbles on your arm with various very dilute antigens so we don't provoke this death response, anaphylaxis. We're gonna dilute it back to 100,000, 100 million, and then we're gonna go up the line and see which dose makes a wheel, an itchy wheel on your arm or your back, a scratch. Um, and we're gonna package that dose, and then all the pollens, we're gonna give you a shot couple times a week. We were charging $7 for that shot uh, twice a week. <clears throat> and over a period of time, we will desensitize you. I came to realize one thing. You're never desensitized. The story in allergy is you keep coming back. I have a friend who's been going to the same allergist near the airport in Los Angeles for 35 years, promising for 35 years that he would someday be desensitized. So I invented the word hyposensitization. Okay, we're gonna lower your sensitivity to ragweed, pigweed, thistle, sage, animal dander, chocolate, you know, etc. cetera. Uh, but we don't think we'll ever cure you. And I still believe that today. I, I, don't, I don't understand allergy, and you'll understand as I go along, but Howard sent me to the Washington University School of Medicine, mm, I don't know, 1975, 76. And there I met the woman partially, if not fully, responsible for what is called the PAP test. Her name was Miriam T.K. Bryan. She was a cytotechnologist, a, a laboratory tech. Her husband was Bill Bryan, a well-known ear, nose, and throat doctor. And over lunch, I got to hear Miriam's story. This woman worked with Dr. Pap Nikolov. Uh, the doctor who got credit for the pap smear. So you take exfoliated cells off the cervix, put it uh, on a glass dish, dry the cells, put a cover slip over it, send it off to a lab, 
and they diagnose based on cells that have already left the body, already left the cervix. And I won't go into that. That's a whole nother conversation we ought to have one day. But I really liked her. And she was telling me, Doug, if you draw blood and pull off, you spin it down at urine speeds, very slow, not blood speeds, urine speeds, very slow, you end up under this serum, this yellow stuff, with a little tiny layer of white. We called it the Buffy coat. And then all the packed red blood cells. As physiology goes, for every 700 red blood cells, there's only one white blood cell. So you got a little tiny layer. We would pull off the Buffy coat while it's still alive. The red blood cells were moving around. We'd expose them on glass slides, much like a pap smear. We'd expose them to various foods. Cucumber, beef, wheat, corn, yeast, brewer's yeast, baker's yeast, milk, you know. And there'd be like a hundred different foods that we'd expose your live white blood cells to. These, and the test was called the cytotoxic, cell toxic test. And it was fabulous. I mean, under a microscope, we did my blood, and under a microscope, the white blood cells, which move around, they have that pseudopod, false foot movement. So they move around and gobble up bacteria or fungus and fall on that shot, bring the house down. <clears throat> Boy, you guys really want to talk. Ooh, Marty Shore, food allergies or intolerances. Number one, Marty Shore works with a company that I honored this morning by swallowing two Dr. O'Hara's probiotics, and I hope you do too. Number two, she and her family are very dear to me. Um, Marty, that's the question I was hoping someone would ask. Food allergies or food intolerances? So I did my test, I ended up with 23 food allergies. I went home, hired a kite, went back to Dr. Godshock and said, we got it. I'll need a couple of microscopes, I need a slow centrifuge, I need a lot of pipettes, uh, bulbs, uh, glass slides. Um, you had to literally make a Vaseline ring on the glass slide, and we used the tops of blood tubes to do that. And we'd punch them out, dip it in Vaseline, so you did that a hundred times, then you'd put beef, corn, you know. Pull off the Buffy coat and drop a drop of that into the beef. And then put a cover glass slip over it, thin glass slip. And you let it sit, and you begin analyzing under the microscope. Um, and folks, I got to tell you, it was dramatic. I mean, it seemed like there were certain foods that reacted all the time. I wrote a book on this. As a matter of fact, I've showed you. Here, here it is. Here I was. Here's the book I wrote. In uh, let's see if you can put that, John. I wrote this in I don't know '82 or '83, somewhere in there. The Food Sensitivity Diet, Ricky and I wrote it, and here I was when I was doing this test. Look at that. Look at that guy. Fu Manchu mustache. I have no doubt, John, I was in, what do they call those high heels? Platform shoes. I had big bell bottoms on. It was just me uh, back in the mid-1970s. I wrote that book, and in that book I expounded really on food allergy. Diet was a big word back then. Judy Mazel wrote the pineapple diet book or watermelon diet or something and all sorts of diet books came out so it ended up the food sensitivity diet. But there were certain foods, uh, corn, peanut, yeast, both bakers and brewers yeast were almost universal reactors and the second you put the drop of white blood cells down you'd see them implode or lose their digestive enzymes in the case of neutrophils would lose their enzymes, it just poured out. Like, what was it in that food that popped their blood cells? Well, I'll, I'll make this long, long story really short. I did that test for a few years. That's how I met Dr. Hughes at USC Medical School. And he wanted me to come in and work with uh, various children. They were testing for uh, attention deficit disorder. Was it a food allergy? And that's how I met Dr. Hughes and began working out there, collaborating with him. And I put my name on a couple of research papers at the young old age of probably 25, 26 years old. Um, this test was a good test, <clears throat> but it was a ballparker. And the allergists hated it. This engineer that I told you worked for aerospace came in one day and I said, you haven't been back in a couple of months. Are you okay? And he said, Doug, I'm way beyond okay. My mom started giving me this every morning. And she brings a little packet. He had a little bowl. And it looked like cottage cheese. And, and he said, well, i got to tell you something. I noticed a trend. If I eat this in the morning, I don't talk like this. 
by one in the afternoon. And I said, what is it? It's cottage cheese? And she, uh, he says, I don't know. She called it yogurt or something. Yogurt. Bacteria. Folks, food allergy happens when the gut is naked. How does the gut get naked? Thank you. Antibiotics, alcohol, birth control pills, and the list is almost endless. How do we beat up the good bacteria that God put there that we have to have so we don't talk like that? And I'm gonna make, I, I'm gonna give you a little research on this. That guy changed my world. <clears throat> I took that food allergy test and opened up, I left Dr. Gottschalk a few years later and opened up the first food allergy testing center in America, in California, and the first year we did a million bucks. This was I don't know, 1978, 79, somewhere in there. We were going out to doctor's offices, drawing blood. They would order the tests. We'd do these tests. I had uh, three or four PhD immunologists on staff. I went to UCLA. I hired a couple of the best, Sudaba Etasami, um, Richard K. Wright. I had the, uh, uh, um, Jeff Chung. I had the best PhDs on staff. And then we hired cytotechnologists like Miriam T.K. Bryan, the woman who helped with pap smear. We hired them, and they would go out in the morning. We'd dispatch them to two doctor's office. They would have three patients. They were all phlebotomists. They drew blood. So they'd draw the blood, carry it back to the lab quickly, right? we put this special uh, component in the tube so it wouldn't clot. We'd get it back. We'd spin it down slowly. I mean, we had an operation going. And then the allergist stepped in. <clears throat> this was in the 1980s. Uh, boy, full-page ads said, you know, be careful. Um, these aren't real allergists. These are phony allergists. Food allergy. And then I'll never forget, John, a guy, the nicest guy you ever want to meet in your life. His name was Robert Hamburger. Can you imagine being an allergist and your name is Hamburger? Um, very pleasant man. I saw him talk one time, and I was angry at him. Because here I'm just getting into food allergy. Open my own laboratory, hire my own employees. We had a neat laboratory going on that we built out. And the front page of the LA Times, 1980, 81, Robert Hamburger, big name at UCSD, University of California, San Diego. The title was, and I'll never forget it, Food Allergy Actually Rare, comma, Science Finds. Nobody has food allergy. So forget these tests only go with an allergist. Folks, they have not changed their tune at all. Allergists and I are maybe that far apart. I want to read you something. <clears throat> it went from that 40 years ago, allergy doesn't exist, to this. Nearly 8% of children and about 4 or 5% of adults have food allergy study fines. This was a couple of weeks ago. Nearly 8% of U.S. children, 5.6 million, have food allergies. Almost 40% of those allergic to more than one food. A study conducted by researchers at uh, a Children's Hospital of Chicago determined. Researchers noted a discrepancy between its findings that 7.6% of U.S. children have serious food allergy and the, uh, here they go, folks, they can't be happy. And the 11.4% reported by oh, parents. How would parents know? What does MD stand for? Me, doctor. Um, which included non-convincing symptoms of food allergy. They don't know. Do they know cancer can be caused by fungus? Nope. Do they know you give rats streptozotocin, which is an antibiotic, to give them diabetes so you can study diabetes? Nope. But the parents, t t t tisk, the parents know nothing about food allergy. Non-convincing symptoms. The child only sneezes or itches his skin, says we MDs, when a child is allergic to food. Well, the parents are saying it, their ear pops. Uh, they wake up in the morning so stuffy they can't breathe. Uh, their joints hurt. Ho, 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 ho. You're not an allergist. So you're 11% of people, uh, and our 7%, there's a discrepancy. You're 4% wrong. Only we're right. And listen to this snotty little statement thereafter. This discrepancy, I'm going to quote it. Uh, this discrepancy underscores the importance of improving patient access to physicians trained in the accurate diagnosis of food allergy. Parents, get off the bus. Only we know real food allergy. I gotta tell you, stuff like this blows me away. Now the good news. I'm gonna reduce your allergy visits today, so don't go away. 
Reactions may actually be intolerances, thank you Marty, intolerances that are difficult for parents to decipher on their own. Tisk tisk. What could parents know? We graduated from medical school. Really? A report came out a few years later that too many tonsillectomies were being done that were unnecessary. Too many oophorectomies, ovaries, uh, uh, too many hysterectomies, too many tonsillectomies. Folks, this is a field that's got some problems. Okay? Number one, there's no bosses. Medicine is a non-policed business. Did you read about the woman that went to Mexico for the rhinoplasty, the nose job, and lost her life? Okay, here's what I like. I love the freedom we have to go elsewhere if we don't like the price. It didn't work for her, and I feel really, really bad about that. Did you ever read the Joan Rivers write-up? It was amazing. The indiscretions that were taken in that operating room, the film that was the shots that were taken, the procedures, the people that shouldn't have been in there. And folks, that never was a big deal. But boy, this woman going to Mexico, stay away from parents and stay away from Mexican doctors. Only we in America are real doctors. Okay. Children with true food allergy, the article goes on, need to be prepared with an epinephrine auto-injector, but only 40% of prescriptions are prescribed for one. Let us tell you how to get better. You'll never get better. You'll stay on allergy shots till you get older. Oh, we'll make, it's no longer $7 a week. This is a field, I gotta tell you, I'm not happy with. We figured out many, many years ago, thank you, that food played a huge role in respiratory allergy. And I had a guardian angel. I had a guy that came in my office with what looked to be white cottage cheese who swore to me if he ate that in the morning, he didn't have food allergies. Guess what he did? See you later, Clay. Thank you. We have a clay and a cray that work here. Ah. He didn't need his respiratory allergies ragweed shot when he ate yogurt. You got that? Now let me just go over this. Here's an article from Allergy, Asthma, Clinical Immunology in the year 2016, volume 12. Recipient of antibiotic prescription in the first year of life is associated with food allergy diagnosis in young children. Multiple antibiotic prescriptions are more strongly associated with increases in the odds of a food allergy diagnosis. What causes food allergies? What did my, what did Dr. Gottschalk's patient teach me? Doug, I've been on so many antibiotics that once I started to replace the good bacteria, lactobacillus, lactobacillus acidophilus, um, I, didn't, I didn't have my allergies anymore. Folks, I thought that was nutty. This bowl of cottage cheese can do that? It took God 20 years working on me. All of a sudden he picks me up and shakes me out, dusts me off, and says, there. That was a guardian angel. That opened your career up, right? And today, thanks to Marty and her family, we have something that I am convinced is preventing tens of thousands of allergist visits. Fix this, and this will get better. Unless you want to be on shots twice a week, hoping to become desensitized. And from the remarks of these people, well, you're not a doctor, and parents aren't doctors, only we're doctors. I just, nah, never mind. Okay, now, Marty, thank you. Food allergy, food intolerance. As my book pointed out, uh, let's say that was 1984. Where are we now? Wow, that was a lot of years ago I wrote that book. We humans make five different proteins or antibodies. We also call those, their B cell lymphocytes make these protective antibodies. They're also called immunoglobins. If you can remember game D. So we make immunoglobin G, A, M, E, and D. Okay? IgE is the allergy and anaphylaxis antibody. Here's where allergists are wrong. Okay? IgG 
induces delayed onset hypersensitivity. So you can eat hot dogs every day and then you get stung by a bee or trauma comes in your life or something shifts your immune system and all of a sudden those hot dogs cause problems. Now, not life-threatening problems, but you know what, Doug? Every time I eat a hot dog, oh, I can't get out of bed in the morning. It's cool because you have, uh, there's a cause and effect relationship. Wow. Every night I eat hot dogs before I go to bed, I can't get out of bed. Here, what do you got to do? Do you see a doctor and have the hip replaced like most Americans do? Or do you stop eating hot dogs? Okay, this is the IgG. Remember Game D? G-A-M-E-D. IgE is called the allergy antibody. Allergists to this day contend that only IgE mediated food allergy is real. And parents are talking about what Marty's talking about, food intolerances. Food intolerances can run the gambit to blepharospasms, eye twitches, I know because I was involved in a research paper many years ago, uh, all the way to life-threatening conditions also, but they don't happen immediately. I also contend that all this peanut allergy stuff that allergists are just jumping through hoops uh, working with, What's the number one most impregnated with poison, fungal poisons product in the world? Corn and peanut, one and two, okay? Peanuts, probably one. And folks, you think because we live in this advanced society uh, with all these scientists around that our peanuts can't be impregnated. It's only in Zimbabwe or Machu Picchu, Peru, right? It, it can't be Los Angeles and New York and LA and Dallas, it is. So I think the reason many people have problems with peanut is they have mycotoxins in them and they get very, very sick. Is the answer to quit eating peanut or is the answer to start seeing allergists and be sensitized? Look, if you're facing an immune reaction so strong you're gonna die, I might go, I wouldn't go to an allergist, I might try and figure this thing out. Um, I would find Here's what they're talking about now, and I think this is pretty bright. They're desensitizing you with peanut. Folks, if 90% of the peanut doesn't contain mycotoxins and it's the, it's the aspergillus mold you're really reacting to, which can kill you, isn't it ironic? Some kids eat peanuts and die immediately. Was it the peanut or was it a poison known to induce death, cancer, in that peanut? Okay? They're talking about desensitizing you with tiny, tiny quantities. It's called the oral challenge test. We used to do it back at Dr. Godshock's office. Tiny dilute amounts of peanut or corn or whatever it is you're allergic to. And be careful because if that milk is tainted with some of these hormones they're now adding or antibiotics, you now know that antibiotics cause food allergy, right? Cause and effect relationship. Or if the peanut is contaminated with aspergillus, they're gonna go nine times out of 10 and think, oh, we did it, this child no longer has. Two weeks later, he gets into peanut with aflatoxin and dies. Just be careful out there, just be careful. Uh, here's another paper, this came out of uh, Harvard, uh, JAMA Pediatrics, 2018, a couple of weeks ago, listen to this. Findings, in this cohort study of 800,000 children, the hazards of developing an allergic disease was significantly increased in those who had received acid-suppressing medications. Do we really put children on acid-suppressing medications? Of course we do. And antibiotics during the first six months of their lives. There's a reason <gasps> the child is regurgitating. There's a reason the child keeps getting infected. A child is born Okay, I'm gonna say it. In one of the most microbial infested buildings in the world, it's called a hospital. Nosocomial infections impregnate all hospitals. And folks, it's not their fault. People go there with pseudomonas bacteria, burn patients on the third floor, right? Cancer patients on the fourth floor. Heart disease patients, diabetes, uh, really, really sick people that are hacking and hacking in ICU. Those germs gotta go somewhere. We no longer open windows or doors in hospitals or schools. It's all absorbed into our lungs. 
That's why even as a visitor to a hospital, you got to be careful. I mean, I saw these people at the resort we stayed at in Los Angeles here over Thanksgiving uh, wearing masks. And normally they're Asian people wearing masks. And Ruth and I are almost high-fiving them. What a great idea. If you're in a room that the windows, fortunately, we had French doors that opened up. But if you're in a room that's sealed up to keep the air conditioned cool and keep the heat warm, um, I got to tell you, I'm pretty close to wearing a mask on an airplane. Um, and there's just things we need to think about that we didn't used to think about. Hospitals are notorious for nosocomial infections. That means germs that are really bad. I wonder how many people go into it. My dad goes into a hospital with one problem and dies of another problem while he's on so many meds in the hospital. You know where I'm going with this. Please be careful. I just want to read you this. Uh, food allergy, an enigmatic epidemic. You know what that means, enigmatic epidemic? This is written by Hugh Sampson, an allergist, in the year 2013 in Trends of Immunology, an enigmatic, <clears throat> excuse me, enigmatic uh, epidemic. Uh, mysterious, we don't know why. How many prescriptions were written this year for children under six years, six months of age? Millions. You gotta be on vaccines, you gotta be on medications, then you gotta be in a real allergist office, not a parent, a real allergist office, and you gotta take their tests and you gotta take their shots. I'm telling you, I'm so glad I left that field so long ago. That's a field that needs, in my humbled opinion, a lot of help. Here you have it. Your allergist doesn't know this, but his scribbling for antibiotics is causing food allergy. Ta-da! Be careful. We now know antibiotics are linked to an increased risk of the five most common types of cancer. More antibiotics, more risk. Now we know. More antibiotics. By the way, heart disease is included in there more antibiotics, more heart disease, and now food allergy. Poking a hole through the gut. So, in 1981, I, or 82, a paper came across my desk. Do you remember that, John? I talk about that. Kyle has it memorized. So do I. Antigenically intact food, molecule, food macromolecules exiting the gut lumen. You know what that means? Intact bits of peanut and corn and wheat exiting through the lining of, thank you, through the lining of the intestine intact, where we make a B cell response. G-A-M-E or D. Okay? If it's an IgE response, that's a true food allergy. Folks, we are, when we're doing food allergy tests, we're testing foods people are eating and making antibodies to. What breakthrough is that? Okay? Maybe the field is advanced from many years ago, but I still have a chip on my shoulder when I think about allergists. Um, and now they're doing it differently. They're talking about taking blood when you go in and having drops that are available. How much is the blood test? Thousand? Wouldn't it be better, and I think many of you can, if you could fix the damage. And I'm going to, look, uh, Dr. O'Hare is probiotics. There, I want you to know, I disclose, I'm, you know, cellophane. I want you to know this. They are paid advertisers on my show for a reason, and they've been with me for 15 years for a reason. That's the probiotic I want to represent. Why? It's alive. It's a living bacteria in a capsule. How many other supplements do you take that are alive? Most probiotics are lyophilized, freeze-dried, and then we hope they reconstitute in the gut. There are a lot of good ones, don't get me wrong, out there. This one is alive. So if I had horrible, horrible food allergies, Doug, there's only 12 things I can eat. Seal up the gut. Don't eat spackle. Seal up the gut. You can do this with psyllium, with bovine colostrum. Most people with holes in the gut weren't breastfed or have been on lots and lots of antibiotics. Seal up the gut and then fix, put the good bacteria back there. And this is a strain that has 12 of the good bacteria in it, okay? So just, you know, this is a good thing. Thank you, Marty, for calling me or for writing. Welcome back, KTC. Hope you had a restful and meaningful Thanksgiving. Family, you know, 
the kids are tiny. One, the grandkids, I wish it was the kids, one and four. And to say I was in that pool a lot was an understatement, but I got to tell you something, and you guys will understand this. Over Palos Verdes <clears throat> came this full moon. And little Berkeley, my, one of my best friends in the world, sat next to me at dinner, and he said, Coco, Grandpa, Coco, can we go in the hot tub, jacuzzi, uh, after dinner? And I said, yeah, we can. And so his mom approved, and he and I sat out there in this, it was dark, it was probably 7 o'clock, with this moon rising over the ocean, you could hear the waves. This was the most, one of the most sensational and meaningful 10-minute events in my whole life. I'm so in love with that little boy, it's amazing, and his brother. Uh, and of course his dad, and his mom, and my other son, and his wife. There we were in this resort with everything I loved right there in one resort. And I didn't care for the food. I like organic food, it wasn't organic. It was, it was meat that I don't ever eat, except I did up there because I was hungry. Um, so they don't pay attention to wild-caught salmon or grass-finished meat, like Ted Slanker, my friend, does, um, or organics. And it's tremendously expensive. And I wrote to them. And I said, we deserve the best when we're paying this kind of money. We've been going every year. And next year, I would like organic food. See if you can pull that off for me. Okay. Yes, we had a wonderful time. Thank you, Cheryl. Hey, Brent, uh, thanks for all the uh, information you bring us. I have a diet question. I noticed that olive, green olives are not on the phase one diet. Are they okay if they're canned or bottled or just in plain water and not fermented? Yeah, salt. Black olives, Brent, that's, let me take you back to the very year that guy came up to me with what I thought was cottage cheese and turned out to be, you know, yogurt, the first yogurt I had ever seen. Um, how did I discern between a red and a green apple back then? Just so happens when I was getting my hair cut one time, there was a, a magazine, probably circa 1940, that had a green apple on the cover and I read the article. And it said green apples uh, have less sugar, fructose, than red apples. Aha, I'm trying to starve fungus, I'll go this way. So black olives, every black olive I could find was uh, maintained in salt water. Uh, and so I said, black olives are okay. The green olives were kind of in a ferment, a yeast ferment back then, 40 years ago. And so I excluded them from the diet. Are they, they okay if they're canned or bottled in just plain water? Yes, they are okay, Brent. Also, coconut milk and coconut cream, are they allowed? Yes, they are. Uh, coconut, excellent source of uh, MCT. Oh, thank you, yeah. MCT uh, oils. And yes, coconut, they say, Brent, that if you, and if you had to live on an island, deserted island, you've seen the shipwreck jokes, you know, there's a guy living on an island and he keeps climbing up a tree and pulling a coconut, you could sustain life for extended periods of time thanks to the MCT, uh, medium chain triglycerides uh, in coconut, thanks to the milk, which would quench your thirst, and thanks to the meat in coconut. That's the only food that you could sustain sustain life on for extended periods of time. Um, okay, now, let me just do a little ad for you. Berkeley and Rex, my little grandsons, his name is Davis Rex. So we got a Berkeley and a Davis. Are they Californians or what? You know, the, the colleges, Berkeley and, and Rex. Uh, Berkeley and Davis, but his middle name is Rex because Katie's dad's name was Rex. He passed years ago, wonderful guy. Um, and so Berkeley and Rex, what did I take? Thank you, John, for bringing this out. I didn't carry it on because I thought it was too many, so I packed it in my suitcase. This is Optivita Silver, the Nano Silver. I literally packed this in my suitcase. And when we got there, the kids didn't get there till the following day, and of course Rex was hacking and hacking, and the airplane ride was a tough one. They got in in the evening. Uh, and so a little teaspoon of this, few times, we literally watched Rex get better and better, and I gave some to Berkeley too, he was fine, but I, I gotta tell you, I'm so impressed. John, you just, what did you take this, oh, you took their hemp. 
because of your back ache. So they have a liposomal hemp, and they'll be in next week to talk with us about this. They have a liposomal, oh, there it is. Boy, did I make a mistake on that price, right? $124.95. Everything. This is, you know, what they have. All this uh, silver. And it's not colloidal silver. Uh, this is much different, as you've probably seen on TV. But $89.95 while supply lasts. Probably closed out. Including that book and that DVD. Um, love this product. And they have lozenges. Yes, they have sugar. But you've got to, uh, do the benefits outweigh the risks? I think because of the silver solution, the good, the right percentage in their lozenges, I love them for kids, I love them for adults. Okay, here, by the way, this is an empty box. Guess what happened to all the lozenges? They're in my travel suitcase. Um, but that's them. Octavita, I love these guys, and they're coming back next week to teach us about their colloidal, or not colloidal, about their uh, hemp. Uh, which is the same as their silver, or uh, same as their silver, and same as their curcumin, right? Um, they have it cleaved on uh, to a carrier to get throughout the body uh, very quickly, and it's a great, great company. Uh, thank you, guys. Okay, let's see. Okay, so. Okay, uh, Jen, this is our YouTube group. I salute you guys. Thank you for joining us. What do you think about intermittent fasting for healing? Jen, an article in on today's, uh, was it Medscape, dispelled, and I don't like myths, um, dispelled the notion that intermittent fasting causes you to heal any quicker than the proper diet. I might agree with that, it, but what is the proper diet? We here on this show believe that I've created something th that's very exciting because it starves fungus. I had no idea, Jen, 40, 50 years ago, that I wasn't the only guy in the world with a fungal problem. You know, jungle rot from Vietnam. Of course, now I realize many people with cancer, heart disease, diabetes, autoimmune diseases have fungal, and the Center for Disease Control agrees with me, have fungal diseases. Intermittent fasting, let me tell you where my heart is on it. Because it's biblical, I like it. Okay? Uh, Maria, have you ever heard of hydrogen peroxide therapy? And if so, what is your opinion? Was diagnosed with an overactive immune system. Can I still take beta-glucan? Yes, you can take beta-glucan. Um, always, though, take it in and check with your doctor. There are some doctors who don't let you take it, believing that beta-glucan you know, s amps up your immune system. It does nothing of the kind. It modulates your immune system. Always ask your doctor. Hydrogen peroxide therapy. Um, look, I know seven or eight doctors who are doing IV, H2O2, uh, hydrogen peroxide. Uh, really like it. Did your mom, Maria, when you were little and you got a cut, did she pour some hydrogen peroxide and that white stuff just foams out of there, the bacteria leaving the body or the germs? I like natural therapies. Don't do this, but I want you to hear this. I would go to a doctor fourth or fifth. Unless it were, you know, if I'm in a car wreck, I'm going to go immediately. Um, I'm going to hope he's doing the right thing. Uh, but I would always look for natural therapies, and i got to be honest with you, please know this, Maria, diet is number one. Man, when I fall off the wagon in two days, I'm back to good old Doug Coughlin. Hey, Doc, Joanne says, <laughs> uh, I have a chronic post-nasal drip, so as you know, it goes down the esophagus into my belly, I'm sorry, stomach, causing a burning sensation when I swallow food. Heartburn, been eating clean on diflucan and nystatin, psoriasis on scalp, and fist, uh, fistured tongue. Wow, Joanne, this sounds exactly like a yeast problem. First of all, understand, Chronic sinusitis, when you talk like that, you get up in the morning and you go into a meeting and you're always talking like that. Chronic sinusitis is due 96% of the time, according to the Mayo Clinic, not Doug Kaufman, Mayo Clinic on 9999, 1999, uh, published that chronic sinusitis is all fungus. And yet you go anywhere today and you talk like that, you're going to get an antibiotic. Antibiotics fuel fungus wrong drugs, but assured you're going to keep coming back in. Medicine blows me away. All I can say is we're not as astute as consumers, medical consumers, as we need to be. Medicine blows me away. Mistakes? 
look, medical errors are now the third leading cause of death in America. First comes heart disease, then comes cancer, then comes medical errors. I don't go into doctor's offices. Last year when I got pneumonia, I went to the 75 buck doc in the box and asked him for an antibiotic prescription. I knew which one I wanted and needed. He was kind enough to give it to me. I exited 10 minutes later and for three days I took that drug. On the third day my hands started going like this. Antibiotics are neurotoxic. So it makes total sense. So I quit them and I used silver and I used olive leaf and I used Colorex and I used many, many things on a every other day rotational basis. Good as new in a few days. <clears throat> so I hope that helps. Uh, uh, yeah, the Diflucan should help you tremendously. If not, ask the doctor, you're dealing with a different species of fungus then. Ask the doctor if you can try Sporinox for a week, 100 milligrams a couple times a day, if he or she will let you do that. Here's the great thing. Today is Tuesday. Tomorrow is Wednesday. And I'm going to tape a show on Thursday because I'm going to be uh, traveling, but you're going to love the show because I'm taking questions we didn't get to. And gosh, we get thousands of questions. And I'm going to be addressing those on Thursday for you. Normal time, 3 to 4 p.m. It's just I won't be sitting here. I'll be traveling. Uh, can I just tell you one thing we're doing for you guys? I think you'll love this. This was the brainstorm of my assistant here for 20 years. We hired this great person to help me 20 years ago when she was 18 years old. She's now 38, has a husband, a couple of kids. She came up with this brainstorm. You're really loyal to your Facebook and YouTube audience. I love them. I get to, I feel, you know, like I'm with them. Um, why don't we have all of our sponsors, let me read them to you. Beta Glucan, Pioneer, Dr. O'Hara's Probiotic. There they are, right there. And there's, yeah, that's all of them. Uh, Dr. O'Hara's has, you know, other probiotics too. Uh, Long Life Unlimited, Poop Doc, Optivita, uh, Prevagen, Life Extension, Aloe Apex. Why don't we have all of them make a basket and let's give away one in December one a day while you do this live show for YouTube and Facebook. You, look at all that product. I mean, Life Extension blew us away. Chris Chase with uh, Pioneer uh, has one of those refrigerator units that keeps your food from aging. It's amazing what everybody did. Frank Jordan, God bless you, Dr. O'Hara, I love those folks. Uh, Optivita, brand new advertiser, and do you think they'd hold back? They ran in to make their products available also. Flexin, I love Flexin. So, your, uh, Jordan is going to draw a name at the end of, starting December 4th. Uh, then December 5th and 6th, and then the next three days, and then the next three days up until we break for Christmas uh, vacation. We're going to give away a lot. These have to be $400 each, you know? They really do, and it gives you, a, you know, a... a a tremendous amount of goodies. You talk about a goodie basket, this is going to be a goodie basket. So we've arranged, thanks to Kristen, we've arranged with all the people who promote, we promote on our TV show, which is a blessing. The TV show has gone so big, thanks to you. Uh, I always say this voice would be lost in the air if not for your ears and your eyes on our TV show. So thank you so much, Know the Cause. It's on so many networks. Um, so that's going to be the giveaway starting Tuesday, December 4th. And you don't have to, here's what he put, no purchase is necessary. You don't have to buy anything. You don't have to buy my book. There's no gimmicks here. At the beginning of each uh, show, we'll give instructions on how to enter and uh, starting December 4th. This thing, I went into the, uh, to the studio, big studio over here. John, there's a wall filled with everything they sent us. They sent it to us free. And then we're going to give you uh, one of absolutely everything free also. You're, you have a good chance of winning this. Uh, we're going to give away nine of these. And I, I just pray that the people who need this the most will win them. And if not, 
that you who need it the least will give them then as gifts to people who need it the most. You know what I'm saying? So good. Okay. Really good. We're getting through all this. Lately, Doug, says Linda, the bottom of my feet and palms have been really itchy. Okay. Seems to be sensitive to foods. I seem to be sensitive to foods that I wasn't sensitive uh, to before. This is all after I moved into a townhome that I'm wondering about water damage to the floor, which is bowed. How can I find out if my recent allergy is due to mold? I love, love, love you and your show and wisdom. Thank you. Saw you once on an American Airlines flight, and you had the kindest demeanor and countenance. I'll never forget Linda. She was sitting in first class, and as I walked through to seat 38D, John and I literally sat, coming back from Orlando, in 38 D and E. <laughs> um, but she was just a charming, wonderful woman. I'm so glad to see that you're doing well, Linda. Now, let me just educate you a lot. Mold changes the rules. Doctors, God bless them, folks. Unless they're integrative or complementary, these are doctors who can write you a prescription for antibiotics. Thank God they're available if you really need them. Can write you a prescription for antidepressants or hormone therapy or birth control pill if you really need them. But they want to talk to you about diet and hydrogen peroxide IVs and chelation therapy and, you know, the cell phone against your head and things of that sort. Um, if they, that group understands the F word. They really know about fungus, okay? So try and find a doctor like that because, Linda, if you go into your average, there's 50,000 of them in the U.S., doctor, he or she won't have a clue. The floors are bowed? What are you worried about? That sounds like an architectural problem. Uh, no, water leaked so much that the floors have bowed. Well, clean it up. Honest to gosh, I don't know what to say anymore. It's time for me to die. I've learned too much on this side. I mean, it's so amazing when people call me and tell me what their doctor said. I can't believe these are postgraduate people. I really can't. Nice people. But if you don't know fungus, you don't know the field you're involved in, nor do you know nutrition. And I'm talking to you dietitians out there now. The cool thing is nurses, Registered and licensed vocational nurses, uh, nurse practitioners, are one of my largest audience. For some reason, they became nurses to really care and hurt and learn like sponges, absorb information. And they often will ask the doctor, uh, Doc, the floor bowed because it rained in the condo. Could be a brand new condo, but if the roof leaked, look, you've got damaged floors. Okay, so Linda, Here's my recommendation, and I gave this recommendation to one of Disney's early artists in the 1970s, early 1972, 73. Leave your big home on the hill. Uh, this guy had asthma, <clears throat> and he had what we didn't know then, we know today, is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. He had all sorts of things going on in his lung. And by the way, Linda, he suspected his home. And so I said, okay, here's what I'd like you to do. And he drew me, I drew some blood for food allergy testing on him, and he, he drew me a picture of Mickey Mouse with a needle in his arm, and it looked, and he signed it Mickey Mouse, and it, uh, we lost it, but um, he, uh, he put, you wouldn't hurt an old man with that needle, would you? It was the coolest picture you had ever seen in your life. I said, I need you to go 100 miles east, Big Bear up in the mountains. I want you to go five, 6,000 feet up and rent a home for a week. Well, that's the craziest thing anyone's ever asked me to do. You're either going to be able to breathe freely up here or not. If you are, it's because you lucked out with a cabin that is relatively yeast and mold free. Ah, I get it, Doug. Then we'll prove that my house is the problem. And the house at that time was, you know, a million dollar house. So today it'd be $20 million house. And so up in the hills he went. We didn't have cell phones back then, but he walked to a gas station and called Dr. Gottschalk and said, I'm on day three. I, I took a walk this morning of a mile. I walked down by the lake. I think I'm going to leave the hill and move up to Big Bear. I don't know if he did. Folks, what we proved, Linda, I want you to hear this. What we proved what was, 
and it rarely is, his lungs. It's not that mass. It's not that lump. It's not that pain. We're told it is because they have prescriptions for that. It's probably your home. It might be your office building. We went out of our way when we built this so many years ago to have a, a really great guy come in. Uh, he has a company that investigates, he squeezes, gets air samples. And he told John and I back years ago that we have one of the cleanest buildings as far as mold and bacteria is concerned because we keep the Pioneer plugged in and we, you know, we, we do things around here. Linda, all you need to do is leave your home for a week. I don't, you, you probably live in LA, I think that's where I met you. Um, go to Big Bear. The higher Crestline, you know, the higher the better. Uh, Tahoe, um, where did I used to ski? Mammoth Mountain, go up to Mammoth Mountain. And uh, if within a couple of days you can have a glass of wine and you aren't congested and you feel great and you don't hurt and the brain is working like you're 18 years old, bingo. Mold changes all the rules and your doctor does not know this. I am sorry. My purpose for being here is to teach you. If the floor is bowed and it's water damaged, I can almost assure you the tingling, the needles, the pins and needles burning, itching, it is mold. If it were this simple, Linda, if, if we walked into a moldy home and our right ear fell off, okay, cause and effect relationship. You'd have a lot of Americans with one ear, but that would be a giveaway. I'm never going in that home again. It isn't that easy. And different people have different mold levels. How many antibiotics have you been on as a, as a kid? How much booze do you drink? You know, we all have different levels of mold in our body. So you're probably up to here, a little more mold inhaling it every day, and wham, you get very, very sick. Thank you, John. Um, get out for a minimum of one week. Go away, vacation, have fun and see if by day three or four, this isn't totally gone. Then talk to an attorney about breaking a lease. I'm, I'm that serious. If I'm given the choice of living in a home that's moldy uh, or breaking a lease or even paying out the lease, I'm paying it out. I don't wanna die of inhaling this stuff. And I think many people do. Good to talk to you, Linda. Um, hi, Doug. Okay, I'm having a heck of a time trying to follow your phase one, your Kaufman one. I just don't have the willpower. <laughs> is there a meal replacement shake? Oh, this is such a good question that you like that has no dairy or grains or sugar. Something simple on the go so I can help kill fungus, help lose the weight. I have tons of food intolerances. I took a blood test that my chiropractor wanted me to get, but I just keep eating everything in sight. This begs one of the most important questions of the day. A food allergy is a cause and effect relationship. Allergists say they're IgE mediated, right? A food allergy means every time you eat that egg, you get a symptom. My logic says stop eating eggs, not theirs. Theirs is let's desensitize you to it. And true, since egg is universal, I mean shots, vaccines have egg in them. So you have to be very, very careful. I just wouldn't get the vaccine, but that's unheard of in medicine today. Um, so desensitizing a food allergy is a problem. Now, a food intolerance, because it's provoked by the IgG antibody, let me make it a little more technical for you. IgG has subclasses. One of them is IgG4. IgG4 and IgE antibodies seem to kind of go hand in hand. So you never know if a food intolerance is an every time I eat it, I have that reaction again. That tends to behave a little bit more like an IgE or a real food allergy. Um, this is where, uh, Maria, once again, have you been on lots of antibiotics? If the, and I'm not talking about last week. As a little girl, did a loving mom take you to a loving pediatrician and put you on antibiotic after antibiotic after antibiotic? If the answer is yes, then 30, 40, 50, 60 years later, you might have horrible food intolerances. Remember what we talked about in the opening of the show? Gut permeability. I'll never forget the name of the paper, 1981, came across my desk. Antigenically intact food macromolecules exiting the gut lumen. Chips of milk leaking through the gut where you make an antibody response to it. 
Doesn't take a genius to figure that one out. But if you got holes in your gut, you're always going to have new food allergies based on the new foods you're now eating. Seal up the gut. Look at a bovine colostrum, a clean, a non bovine somatotropin hormone, BST, a non GMO, a non. Look for grass finished bovine colostrum, and that will help seal up the gut. Then use psyllium. A poop doc has a blonde psyllium that I think is one of the best on the market. Once again, sidebar disclosure, they advertise on my TV show called Know the Cause. There are a lot of good psylliums out there. I just take that one. Um, fix this and you'll probably realize I don't need a supplemental diet. Within a few weeks, I can pretty much eat anything. Now, it may take months, depending on how big the holes are, right, and how well you're chewing. There are a number of factors. Um, don't let this get you down. Fix it. Fix it. I'd start with taking the next 30 days and seeing if I can stop the leakage that is probably going on in the gut. Then, a glass of milk that's grass-finished milk shouldn't bother you at all. That's what I do. Maria, stay in touch with us and let us know how you do on that. A lot of times when I eat mainly carbs, I get what's called a spicy mouth. It feels hot, have sweets sometimes, get a massive headache for a day or so. Is this a food allergy? Kim, um, here's where the allergist would come in. An allergist can tell you the difference between a food allergy and a food sensitivity uh, based on the antibody that is made. Remember, food allergy is IgE. Food intolerance is IgG antibody, or sometimes IgM, which converts to IgG eventually. A lot of times, not all the time, when I eat mainly carbs, I get a spicy mouth. It feels hot. Uh, have sweet sometimes. Sometimes is the operative word. You said a lot of times and sometimes. Not every time. True food allergy means every time I eat it, I get the spicy mouth or the bad migraine. Um, Kim, I don't know if you've done this yet, but if you can, try and follow along my Kaufman One Diet one month. There's a lot of foods in it. Um, and see if you have those same reactions. It doesn't surprise me the carbs that feed fungus and sweets that feed fungus are both causing these reactions. Are you watching me on Facebook or YouTube? If you're watching me on Facebook, God bless you guys. Thanks for joining me. YouTube, ring my bell. Like the show. Help me gain this popular uh, show in more markets. Uh, most importantly, send it to your friends. I'll be back at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning to answer some more questions. Thank you for joining me now. God bless. Bye-bye.